Okay, hello. Um, so one last time I'll ask if there's questions about the final paper, about grading, anything like that. I have a quick question. Yes. Um, with regards to grading, I know there's no like number percentage on Canvas. It just says a letter grade. Yes. Um, is there is there a way to know like the exact percentage, or does it like matter, or what do you think? Um. Uh. So I just I just use the letter grade, and I use like a GPA system when I average them. Does that answer your question? So like if that letter grade is is like letter grade is A, that means it's going to be four. You know, the letter grade is uh, A minus will be like three point seven five. The right, got it. That that answers it. Thank you. All right. Um, okay. Any other questions? Um, I have a question. Yes. Um, would it be possible if we were to able to ask some questions after class, if we feel like after this lecture we still don't understand or may have like lingering um, thoughts? After class, um, I and guess for if so, uh, what is your time limit? Just so I'm not taking up too much of your time. Yeah, I mean, after class is not ideal, but I could stay for a little while after class. Um, but you know. Tomorrow's already kind of filling up, but um, yeah, let's see. I'll tr I'll stay for a little while after class, and if there's still more questions, we'll try to make a time to uh, meet. Okay, professor. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? Okay. So. Um, I'm going to talk more today about Wollstonecraft's relationship to Hobbes, Locke, and Rousseau, all three. Um, and uh, but I think in the process, I'm going to come back and some, you know, one more time to some of the fundamental issues that keep coming up throughout this course. So uh, be I don't know, not really a summary, but at least hopefully a fitting last lecture. Um, now, you might think this particular chapter, chapter 13, except for the very last section, is not promising material for that. Um, it's really uh, a bunch of kind of miscellaneous topics, um, or at least it seems that way on the surface. Um, I think if I had time to talk even more about it, I could make more out of that connection than is obvious. But um, and and some of them, some of the topics don't seem very um, interesting or important. Uh, like, you know, um, questions about whether women waste too much time reading novels or consulting astrologers or something like that. It hardly seems like a pressing political issue. But as a matter of fact, the way she understands these things, they are mixed in with a lot of really fundamental points. Um, so to start off, um, so I'm going to start with a comparison with Locke. But to start the comparison with Locke, I'm going to first read what Wollstonecraft says. Um, near the very end of the book. Um, by the way, I'm having trouble. I, my notes didn't print out correctly, so I have them up on the screen here. And can't see everything at the same time. <laughs> but uh, hopefully I'll manage to keep an eye on everything somehow. Um, all right, so this is on the last page of the book, page 201. Um, which... 
so um, it's this uh, weird paragraph where she suddenly entertains the thought that actually, you know, maybe uh, women can't be educated. Now, I mean, I don't think she's seriously entertaining it. This is like a rhetorical move on her part. Um, but anyway, so this is what she says. Let woman share the rights and she will emulate the virtues of man, for she must grow more perfect when emancipated or justify the authority that chains such a weak being to her duty. Right? So she's saying like, if after women are given their rights, you don't see their an, uh, increase in their virtue, then it will mean that they're not rational beings after all. And she says, if the latter, it will be expedient to open a French trade with Russia for whips. <laughs> now, this is, beside being kind of shocking image, it's also another weird kind of pre-echo of Nietzsche but again, doesn't seem like Nietzsche was aware of her, so um, it's just a coincidence, I guess. But in any case, uh, so skipping all the kind of uh, weird stuff about whips in the middle, getting towards the end, um, allowing this position. So in other words, uh, I'm sorry. I'm not pointing to the text. Allowing this position, women have not any inherent rights to claim. Right? So if it's true that women really can't be improved by being emancipated, then it would turn out that they had no rights to claim. And by the same rule, their duties vanish. For rights and duties are inseparable. She says, but in that case... If it really turned out that women are not rational beings, then not only do they have no rights, but they have no duties because you can't have rights. You can't have duties unless you have rights. Um, so it wouldn't make sense to say, for example, uh, women, your duty is to obey men and not think about it because a being that... Uh, um, could be told to obey someone else and not think about it is uh, a being that has no rights and therefore has no duties. So you can't tell it that it's something is its duty. Now, um, this is the part that I'm saying uh, um, is, this, is the same basic position that Locke takes in the second treatise, right? Remember, he says there that law and freedom are not opposed to each other, um, right? Uh, you know, uh, Hobbes says what might seem kind of obvious, that law and freedom are opposed to each other, right? So if there's a law, it places impediments in your way, and therefore it makes you less free. But Locke says law and freedom are not opposed to each other, um, um, they're the same thing, basically. Um, you are bound by a law if you are, as he puts it, quote unquote, free of that law. That is, um, a law exists to protect the freedom of those who can be expected to obey it. That's the way he understands that. Right, so that's why he says, for example, that children, which is also an important theme of Wollstonecraft's in this chapter, um, children, until they are able to use their own reason, um, um, can't be expected to follow the law of nature, and therefore uh, they can't be, they're not bound by the law of nature. And therefore, they're not protected by the law of nature, right? The law of nature doesn't grant them that space in which they can be free by keeping other people out of it because they're not the kind of beings that can enter into that agreement yet. They can't be expected to keep out of other people's spaces. 
um, right? He says that about the law of nature, and he says that also about the civil law of a country until the child is old enough that the law considers them competent. And competent what? Well, competent to follow the law, basically. Until that time, they don't have the rights of a citizen either. Um, right? So, so this is basically um, the same idea we saw in Locke. But the question is how this goes together with um, Locke's definition of punishment from the essay. So, um, this was part of the assigned rest reading from the essay concerning human understanding that was up on Canvas or is still up on Canvas. Um, oops. It's um, book two, chapter 28, section five, on page 316. This is a little bit out of focus. Okay. Good and evil, as hath been shown, are nothing but pleasure or pain, or that which occasions or procures pleasure or pain in us. Morally good and evil, then, is only the good or evil is, uh, sorry, is only the conformity or disagreement of our voluntary actions to some law, whereby good or evil is drawn on us from the will and power of the lawmaker. Right, so moral good and evil, like what he says in that first sentence is that good and evil either means pleasure and pain or the means of procuring pleasure and pain. And a particular means of procuring pleasure and pain is um, in a situation where good or evil will be drawn on you from the will and power of the lawmaker. So now um, um, you can well, I guess you actually want to avoid pain and procure pleasure. But anyway, like you can avoid pain by not violating the will of the lawmaker, or you can, uh, procure, if there's rewards, you can procure pleasure by obeying the law, will of the lawmaker. Um, which good and evil, pleasure or pain, attending our observance or breach of the law by the decree of the lawmaker is that we call reward and punishment. Right, so punishment means pain, um, you know, or things that lead to pain or diminish pleasure or whatever. But anyway, let's to keep it simple. Let's just say pain, pain that you can expect to follow from violating a law because of the will of the lawmaker. That's what punishment is, and then moral. Evil is conduct that, that, that brings pain on you for that reason. So you violate a law, and the, therefore, the, by the will of the lawmaker, some pain follows to you. And so that action was an evil that is a way of getting pain. And it's a particular type, the type that right, results from violating a law, and that's called moral evil. Um, and then, as you may remember from there, it, he goes on to explain that, therefore, moral evil is relative to the lawmaker, right? Like, what counts as moral evil depends on which lawmaker you have in mind. Um, and um, so that was the definition of punishment in Locke. And also, of course, Locke says, um, this was one of the uh, um, questions or, for the, or prompts for the last paper, and most people who answered this didn't have too much trouble explaining it. Locke says that a law is vain if reward and punishment are not attached to it, right? Because it's in vain to give a command, he says, to a rational creature if you don't give them a reason to follow it. Um, because they are going to do what they think 
will get them pleasure or avoid pain. They definitely are. So uh, there's no point in telling them to do something if you can't give them a reason to. That is, that pleasure will follow from doing it or pain will follow from not doing it. Okay, but, um, but if you put those things together, and I think I emphasized this before when I talked about it, but I emphasize it again, that um, according to Locke, if some evil, that is pain, is drawn on us as a natural consequence of violating some principle that someone sits down, then that isn't enough to make that principle a law. Because that pain that naturally follows from doing what they said not to do um, is not a punishment. It's not a punishment because it's not due to the will of the lawgiver or lawmaker. Um, so like, for example, you know, suppose I say to you one day, uh, you know, don't eat food so-and-so. Like as a general rule, I give you that command. And you say, well, why shouldn't I? So if my answer is because it will make you sick, then my command is not a law. Right? I, that is rather I'm giving you advice or what Hobbes calls counsel. Right? I'm, 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 I'm telling you something and I'm telling you you have a reason to do it, but the reason you have to do it is not that I'm telling you and is not connected to the fact that I'm telling you. Um, the reason would have existed if I told you or not. The food is going to make you sick. I'm just informing you of that. So that's advice. It's not a um, that that consequence is not a punishment, and the command is, or what looks like a command, is not really a command or not really a law. It's really counsel. Whereas if I answer, you know, because if you eat that food, I will smite you, then that's a law. <laughs> Right, because now I'm giving you a reason not to eat it, and the reason is because I'm telling you not to eat it, or it's a consequence of the fact that I'm telling you not to eat it. Um, okay, so all of that was just all of that was lock. Um, are there questions about that before I go on? Okay, so now remember that Locke, unlike Hobbes, thinks that the law of nature or the divine law or the law Mr. of reason. I have a question. Yes, question. Um, when you were talking about Locke and children, so yes. you're saying that this, they're not bound and protected by the law of nature because they're not subjected to it. But what is it that happens? What is it that they don't have um, that allows them to exist in that, in, the, in their youth? You mean, what are they missing or what is it that protects them if the law doesn't protect them? Which Both. Both. <laughs> so what they're missing is the use of reason. And it's the same thing actually that Wollstonecraft keeps talking about in this chapter, and she mentions it with respect to children, uh, brutes, that is, non-human animals, um, women who are not properly educated, which is most women, she says, in her time, um, uh, and savages also, she sometimes mentions. Um, I don't think Locke agrees with that about savages. Um, but, well, be that as it may, um, so, and she says what they're all missing is the, uh, power to form abstract ideas in which terms of which universal principles can be, uh, can be stated. So it's, you know, so that children, and I mean, obviously this isn't, um, all every child at every age, but you know, as a, as a rule, at least she and Locke agree that up to some point they're not able to form these abstract ideas or they have a hard time with it. And so they have a hard time thinking about um, laws 
which are universal principles. Um, so they really, they really can't understand something like, you know, here's a universal principle and you should follow it because if everyone follows it, blah, blah, blah. Did that? Yeah, that made sense. Um, and as far as what will protect them, so the answer is, of course, their parents are supposed to protect them. And their parents are supposed to protect them by um, most well, I mean, there's two things that are most important of what their parents are supposed to do. First of all, their parents are supposed to educate them so that they will attain the use of reason. But second of all, until that happens, the parents are supposed to control them in such a way that everyone else can be sure that um, that although the child itself is not capable of following the law, its parent will ensure that it does, right? So that's why the parent assumes the person of the child, becomes the guardian of the child, becomes the legal representative of the child. The, the parent is someone who is going to uh, guarantee that the, that the child is under control and is going to um, look out for the child's interests the way the child would if they could both of those things together, right? And that's what, if you remember, that's what Locke, so Locke says that, you know, the, the dominion that parents have over children is strictly for the good of the children because without it, they couldn't survive in society. They need someone to be, who has the use of reason to be, um, uh, teaching them what to do, and in the meantime, making sure that uh, that they don't violate other people's rights. I mean, in addition to feeding them and all that other stuff. But as they, actually, I think that those two parts, education and like, um, I don't know, so substitute, that, that yeah, okay. Thank all right. you. I yeah, and so and I think Wollstonecraft pretty much agrees with Locke about all of that. You know, whether uh, it's a good question how much I think they're right about children. I mean, one thing weird thing I noticed with my children when they were younger, uh, that is to say, a long time ago, like when they were toddlers basically, well, maybe a little, well, anyway, that it was easier to tell them that you weren't allowed to do something than it was to tell them it was impossible. Like, if they said, you know, I want ice cream, and you said, no, we're not allowed to have ice cream until after dinner or something like that, then they would kind of accept it. But if you said, no, we don't have any ice cream and I can't go to the store now, blah, 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 then they would just start screaming. <laughs> I don't know what that means in terms of this, but it it, sh it probably shows that these things are more complicated than you might think. But anyway, and I don't know if that result generalizes or which is my weird children. Um, all right, but anyway, that's what Locke and Hobbes think about that, I believe. I mean, sorry, Locke and Wollstonecraft believe about that. Right? Okay. So anyway, uh, right, so going back to Locke and Hobbes. So Locke, unlike Hobbes, thinks that the law of nature, which is the same thing as the divine law, right, the law of nature, It's the same thing. Now, this is for Locke, but again, I think Wollstonecraft agrees. Divine law or Wollstonecraft and Hobbes agree. And Rousseau too, I guess. Um, right? But these are synonymous. Or, well, anyway, they refer to the same thing. They have the same extension. Uh, I'm not sure if you should say they're synonymous. So, um, so right. So Locke and Hobbes agree that those are the same things, but they what they disagree about is that according to um, 
lock this law of nature divine law law of reason literally is a law even in the state of nature whereas according to hobbes in the state of nature um the law of nature is only counsel is only it's the counsel of reason as he puts it it's not a command um Right, and you can see why if you think, as Hobbes does, that in the state of nature, no one um, is uh, enforcing these laws. So the only reason you have to keep them is to the extent that you can see your own advantage in keeping them, which in the state of nature is not very far. Right? Remember, actually, it only goes to a bare wish that they be obeyed, according to Hobbes. But even that, that wish, you know, I mean, it's, it's a wish you should have if you know what's good for you. Um, so it's not really literally a law. Now, um, Hobbes does say, maybe I should have brought this to show it on the document viewer too, but I didn't. But anyway, Hobbes does say, you know, Right after he says that about the law of nature, no, it's right here. It's the end of chapter. Fifteen. Why not? This is Leviathan chapter 15, paragraph 41 on page 100. These dictates of reason men use to call by the name of laws, right? Men use to call means that they usually call them, or, you know, it's customary to call them by the name of laws, but improperly, for they are but conclusions or theorems concerning what conduceth to the conservation and defense of themselves, whereas law properly is the word of him that by right hath command over others. So, um, right, so again, these are just good advice, basically. He uses the word counsel somewhere else in this paragraph, maybe. I thought it was in this sentence, but it's not. But anyway, elsewhere, he's, maybe it's the beginning of chapter 14. He says it's the counsel of reason. But yet if we consider, so he does add this, but yet if we consider the same theorems as delivered in the word of God, that by right commandeth all things, then are they properly called laws. So, right, so Hobbes seems to be saying that, you know, as long as you look at it as the law of nature or the law of reason, then it's not literally a law, it's just good advice. But when you look at it as a divine law, then you can see, ah, it's a divine command, so it's not just advice. However, I'm not going to go through this argument again, but I talked about it when we talked about it in the last lecture about Hobbes, when I talked about Hobbes' views on religion. I think, you know, when you look into the definition of command and the nature of God according to Hobbes and what he says about punishments for violating the laws of nature and so forth, you see that in the end, the idea that something is a command of God for Hobbes in the state of nature is basically empty. In the civil state, it means that the sovereign tells you that God thinks this, right? So it basically is a, is a command of the sovereign. But uh, in the state of nature, it doesn't really mean anything except... A, it doesn't add anything to the fact that it would be a good idea to follow these laws, essentially. Um, the punishments of them, as Hobbes explains, that are just bad consequences of doing them. They're not really punishments as Locke has defined it. So, um, so, but again, Locke disagrees. Locke says it really is a law in the state of, even in the state of nature. And moreover, in a civil state, it's still a law even if the sovereign goes against it. So, um, 
There must be bad consequences that follow from violating the, state, the law of nature because of the will of the lawmaker, not just because it would be a good idea to follow these laws. Um, that is, according to Locke. So then, of course, and this was another part of that same prompt on the paper, um, then, of course, there will have to be an executive, right? That is someone who carries out those bad consequences when some individual, some individual does violate the law. Um, so as I said before in the essay, um, you know, who is the executive in the state of nature? Uh, in the essay, it seems like the answer is God. And God is going to... Um, punish you in the afterlife if you violate the law of nature. And that's what you're supposed to be able to discover by reason, not by revelation. Um, because, you know, in... Uh, um, not all rational beings in maybe no rational beings in the state of nature have a revelation. So this has to be something you can get at by reason. Um, but any case, you know, that's what he says in the essay, whereas in the second treatise, he seems to say rather that everyone is the executive in the law of nature, in the state of nature. So everyone is executive of the law of nature in the state of nature. So, you know, um, right, so we have these two possibilities. The executive is God or the executive is everyone. Now, by everyone, we mean, and this is kind of important in this context, not everyone altogether is a body. That's exactly what we don't have in the state of nature. Right? They, we don't have a way of acting together as a corporate entity that is in a body. Right? We, um, we each act on our own. So when we say that everyone is the executive, we mean that everyone individually or you might also say sometimes uh, people say distributively Right? It's everyone, not all together, but this one, this one, this one, this one, this one. Each individual one is the executive in the state of nature. Um, I wrote down a page in the wrong book, so I think I'm just going to read this to you from my notes, the quote here. From, and I'm reading this from the second treatise partly because uh, this is one point that people seem to have trouble finding. Well, I mean, I only graded nine papers, so I have a very small sample. But at least I saw some people have trouble finding this part. Um, this is in uh, Chapter 2, Section 7. Actually, I should be able to find that, right? Section 7. Here it is. It's the bottom of page nine. Um. um. and that all men may be restrained from invading others' rights and from doing hurt to one another, and the law of nature may be observed, which willeth the peace and preservation of all mankind, the execution of the law of nature is, in that state, put into every man's hands, whereby everyone has a right to punish the transgressors of that law to such a degree as may hinder its violation." For the law of nature would, as all other laws that concern men in this world, be vain, be in vain, if there were no body, I guess if there were nobody, <laughs> is how we would read this, that in the state of nature had a power to execute that law. 
right? So there has to be an executive. That's what the point we already made. But but uh, who is the executive? And again, in the essay, it seems the executive is God and the will of the lawgiver from which punishment is going to follow is the divine will. Whereas in the second treatise, it seems like the executive is each individual human being. He says man, presumably he doesn't mean to exclude women, although already we have that ambiguity, right? But in any case, um, the executive in the state of nature is every human being individually. Everyone can decide on their own what to punish and how. Um, I mean, they're not supposed to decide arbitrarily, of course. They have to decide what is the law of nature using their reason, and they have to decide what punishment will serve to ensure that the law of nature is observed in the future, using also using their reason. But uh, everyone is on their own in doing that. Um, okay, so those are two possibilities for who, who is the executive, but Here's another question. Who is the legislator? Of the law of nature. So this, in a way, was already raised by Hobbes when he said we could look at it as advice of reason. Um, so then we might think the legislative authority, the legislative power in the state of nature is reason, whatever that means. Or we could look at it as divine commands. So then we would say the legislative authority is God. Now, um, so I said and that obviously corresponds to this equivalence, that we could call it either the law of reason or the divine law. Now, um, what does it mean to say reason is the legislator? I mean, uh, you know, it's a metaphor to say reason gives us advice or commands or whatever. Reason isn't a, literally a person. Um, so, um, what this really means that reason is the legislative is, I think, again, that everyone is the legislative in the state of nature. But now, everyone means something different. So, rather than being distributive, it's collective or um, it's everyone's universal will, as Rousseau puts it. Um, right, meaning not um, kind of the will of each individual all added together, um, but um, what is universal to everyone's will insofar as they are rational, what we all want for the sake of all of us. Um, but now, you know, so in Rousseau, the concept of universal will turns up in founding and uh, continuing uh, commonwealth, uh, legitimate commonwealth, right? And the universal will we're talking about is the will of a certain people or nation. Um, um, the people of some particular commonwealth. But here we're in the state of nature and there is no Commonwealth. So, what universal will are we talking about? And we're talking. So, we're talking about um, the 
the will of all rational beings. The will that's universal to all rational beings insofar as they all want something on behalf of all of them together. <laughs> okay, I mean, now, um, that may sound kind of bizarre, like, how would you know that? <laughs> um, which, I mean, you could say the same thing about this alternative, too, right? I mean, if we're going to say God is the legislative, I mean, remember, another mark of law, according to Locke, is that it has to be known. It has to be promulgated as the will of the legislator. And here, legislator, not in Rousseau's sense, but in the sense of the legislative authority. Right? We have to know that the legislative has made this law. So in both of these cases, you might think, well, how could we know? I mean, we don't know what God wants or what all rational beings considered as a collective want, right? I mean, we certainly can't bring them all together to vote the way Rousseau thinks we're going to find the universal will. Um, So the answer, and this is why the two are supposed to be equivalent, according to Locke. Um, and again, I guess according to all these people, ultimately, the reason these two are supposed to be equivalent is that the, the way of finding either of them out is the same. Namely, you have to reason, ask yourself, what would a good and wise being want us to do, right? That is, a being that has our collective interests in mind. What would it want us to do? So you can call that being God, or you can call that being um, the universal will of all rational beings. It's, it's the same for these purposes. Okay, are there questions about that so far? This is getting really close to Kant for people who are familiar with Kant. It's also getting really close to Wollstonecraft. I said at the beginning, and I still think this is true, that although there's certain ways that Wollstonecraft is close to Kant, I don't think it's because of a lot of maybe some influence of Kant or something she's heard about him or something, but I don't see a lot of Kantian terminology. I don't see a lot, except for duty. She uses that word a lot, but, um, but other than that, I mean, you know, I don't see anything about the noumenal self or uh, um, categorical imperative or any of that stuff. Um, I think uh, it's not necessary to think that there's a strong influence of Kant on her to explain why they're similar, because they're both um, um, they're both very interested in Locke and Rousseau. Hobbes, also, I guess. Um, yeah, I guess Hobbes also for both of them. So, um, um, but, you know, so she is close to Kant in some ways at this point, um, and, you know, in part because Locke and Rousseau are very close to Kant at this point. But if you don't know anything about Kant, then forget everything I just said, because you don't have to know if it is close. But, well, no, don't forget it. You should want to take another course to find out. <laughs> um, all right. Um, so, um, I mean, when I, I say she's close, but I, I don't think she's the same as Kant, actually. I don't think her conclusion is the same. Her political conclusion is certainly not the same as Kant's. Um, so um, in any case, um, so, okay, so that kind of makes this better. Um, we have... Seem, we seem to have these two alternatives as to who the legislative is, but it turns out that, and they both seem like impossible 
legislative bodies to to appeal to but it turns out that they're both easy to appeal to and you appeal to them both in exactly the same way namely by thinking for yourself what is the best for rational beings collectively um and i think that's exactly how Locke thinks that you should you should find out what the law of nature is. Um, um, so it's certainly the way Wollstonecraft thinks you should find out. So the only question though is, which we can see um, now is actually Rousseau's question about how to found the Commonwealth, but now in a new and more difficult context. Um, in what sense has the legislative appointed the executive? Because um, if the legislative hasn't appointed the executive, then Locke's condition of there being a punishment and reward attached to the law is not fulfilled. Right? Like, if I say to you, don't eat food so-and-so, because otherwise that guy over there is going to smite you, then I'm still just giving you advice. That's not a law. Right? The bad consequence has to follow from the will of the lawmaker. So, you know, if I say otherwise, I'm going to send that guy over there to smite you. <laughs> um, I think I'm thinking of the word smite because we're talking about God here, obviously. <laughs> send that guy. Otherwise, I'm going to send that guy over there to smite you. Then that's a law, right? But if I just if I'm just warning you, hey, you know, that guy over there is not doesn't like it when people eat food so and so. Um, then that's not a law. It's just advice. Um, and I think that, um, uh, there's a problem about this from Locke's point of view, even if we say that the legislative and the executive are both God. I mean, there's obviously a question here, right? Like if you say that they're both everyone. It doesn't solve the problem because um, it's not everyone in the same sense, right? Like all rational beings may want so and so, but all rational beings haven't appointed me to enforce it, or you, or anyone else. Um, but and I guess you know, I mean, we haven't appointed God to do anything, apparently. Maybe we have, but then that's got to be understand. It's understood in a special way. It's a problem. So, but even if you say they're both God, it's still a problem because it's always a problem for the legislative to appoint the executive. That's what Rousseau is pointing out. That's why he has a problem there because the legislative, as such, can't make arbitrary decrees. Um, it can't. Uh, appoint individuals. And if you, at least, if you think of God in a certain way, but it seems like it is the way Locke is thinking about God. If you think about God in a certain way, then God is um, an individual, a more powerful and knowledgeable individual than everyone else, and therefore a good choice for the executive let's say, but uh, still only a choice. I mean, you know, you can see it's a choice by looking at these two alternatives, which these two don't seem to be the same at all, right? If, if the question is, why should you keep the law of nature when you're in the state of nature? Is it because if you violate it, God will punish you in the afterlife? Or is it because if you violate it, other people around you will punish you. Those are two completely different reasons, right? So, I mean, if God is the legislative um, and now is trying to appoint an agent to execute the, the, law, the divine law, there's a choice. Do it yourself or leave it to all the individuals to do it. 
And it's definitely a real choice because, I mean, Locke says one thing in one place and another thing in another place. Um, so, uh, um, so, but this is a choice that a legislative as such can't make, is what, is what Rousseau is going to say at this point. Okay, so all of that is kind of um, a buildup to trying to understand what Wollstonecraft is talking about in this chapter. Are there any more questions before I go on? Okay, so I mean, um, so this chapter, chapter 13, contains um, one of Wollstonecraft's, I guess, most explicitly the religious arguments. And why am I putting religious in quotation marks? Not because I'm suggesting that she isn't really religious, like the way I might suggest about Hobbes. Um, I mean, I think there is some controversy about that actually, based on things that her husband, Godwin, wrote about her after she died. But um, having read it, I, her stuff, I don't, I don't believe there's a reason for controversy. I think she really is uh, religious, but the question is, what does that mean? <laughs> right? That's always the tough question. Um, so uh, what does she think that means? So, um, so she makes this explicitly religious argument um, in this chapter in the course of arguing against believing in astrology. Now, um, I know at least one student in this class has been giving me insights into the people we're reading based on astrology, so I don't want to um, necessarily take Wollstonecraft's point of view about this. Uh, although, I mean, I have to say, I used to be an astrophysicist. I don't really believe in astrology. But um, but in any case, be it as it may, Wollstonecraft definitely does not believe in astrology, um, perhaps because she's a double Taurus, as I was told. Um, but in any case, for whatever reason, she doesn't believe in it. Um, and she also doesn't believe in certain kinds of quack medicine that were current at the time, which she looks at as kind of uh, miraculous or magical ways of trying to cure disease. Um, so there's, I mean, there's certain factual questions about these practices that she doesn't take up, you know, like, I guess the practitioners would claim, no, this, there's nothing miraculous about this. It's just science or something like that. But she, you know, she doesn't go into that, but in any case, um, um, she argues against both of these practices. Um, and, you know, she singles them out because she says women are especially prone to them. Um, again, meaning, I think, uh, women of the class that she's talking to, right, have time and money to, to spend visiting astrologers and magnetists and other uh, practitioners like this. So, um, so anyway, it might seem surprising then, but it's true that in arguing against these things, she appeals to religion rather than science. That is, rather than saying that they're pseudoscientific, she says that they're superstitious. Um, right, superstitious, I mean, we saw this term in Hobbes already, we see it like a lot of our authors use it, but basically superstitious means that it's uh, like religion, but unlike religion, properly speaking, the way it should be, it's irrational or, or anyway, it's, it's, it's not based on the true principle of religion, whether that's reason or something else. Um, so, um, so this, and that does make sense in terms of what she means by religion. So this is what she says on uh, page 189. She just, at this point, has just finished talking about um, Wait, 
is oh, 189. All right, she just finished talking about certain forms of religion that she considers superstitious, if not blasphemous. Um, and then she says, rational religion, on the contrary, is a submission to the will of a being so perfectly wise that all he wills must be directed by the proper motive, must be reasonable. Right, so rational religion means um, submitting to the will of God because the will of God is the voice of reason. And again, therefore, how do you know what the will of God is? Um, consult your reason. <laughs> right, I and mean, she's actually pretty explicit about this in certain uh, places in this book. I didn't uh, call attention to them. I read them. I, I've can't find them now, but, you know, she says things like, you know, she talking about the creation story in Genesis. She says, you know, uh, Moses's beautiful story about the origin of the world, uh, you know, um, can't be true because uh, this is not what a rational God would do. Um I don't remember exactly what words she puts it in. I think, you know, she's aware that she's at least uh, um, uh, going to offend people by saying that. Um, but, you know, I don't know if I don't remember. I don't think she makes it clear if she means something like it can't be literally true, it must be reinterpreted, or um, it can't, it's not really true at all, it's just what Moses, it's a story, it's a beautiful story that Moses told and we can learn things from it, but you shouldn't believe it. Um, I mean, those two things are kind of close to each other, obviously, kind of, from some point of view, dangerously close to each other. In any case, one way or the other, the point is, she doesn't think, when she says submitting yourself to the will of this being, she doesn't mean, you know, you might think it means something like this. I know God knows more than me and is more reasonable than me. So I want to act reasonably. So I forget what seems reasonably to me and I ask God what to do. But um, that's not what she's saying. She's saying if you want to know what God wants you to do, the only way is to consult your reason. Um, okay, so that's what she means by religion. And um, then she's going to put religion in that sense. She's going to put it to use in criticizing astrology and so forth. Um, uh, I mean, she act, this passage is actually from before the one I just read, but she's, this is where she's putting that same view about religion into use to attack astrology. It's on page 188. Um, wait, where is this? Um, so which one does this in my notes? Oh, it's down here. Um, it appears evident to sober reason that certain vices produce certain effects. And can anyone so grossly insult the wisdom, wisdom of God as to suppose that a miracle be allowed to disturb his general laws, to restore to health the intemperate and vicious, merely to enable them to pursue the same course with impunity. 
right? So this is in this paragraph, she's more directly dealing with these types of like wonder working medicine that she's um, thinking about than astrology, but she has a similar critique of astrology about like, you know, who should we think, uh, how, who, who, how should we think that God would inform us about the future, essentially, I guess you should put it. But so in this context, though, she's saying, um, you know, if someone says, pay me money and I'll miraculously cure your, your, cure your, of your disease, um, the reason you have that disease is because of certain vices of which that disease was a consequence. Does she think this is always true? Um, well, I think based on what she says somewhere else, she doesn't think it's always true, but she thinks it's true of uh, kind of chronic complaints, that they're always a result of um, distemper in the body, of improper mixture in the body, and um, and that's due to improper diet, exercise, and so forth. Um, this was kind of the accepted medical view in the 18th century. Um, so uh, maybe this is more plausible then than it would be now. Um, but but in any case, so her her basic argument is, I guess, without trying to say that that's always true, you can at least um, get it down to this. Like, um, there's certain vices that are vices because they're bad for you. Um, and the punishment for doing them is that you get sick. Um, and um, you know, God in his wisdom has set things up to teach us not to do those things because um, we see the consequences. Now someone comes along because they have a little extra money and time and they happen to know this miracle worker and gives hands over the money and the miracle worker allows them to evade, to, to uh, keep the vice but evade the consequences. So like divine justice has been interfered with. Um, that's the argument, right? So, so she's saying not that it's unscientific to believe in this kind of miracle, but that it's irreligious to believe in it. Um, of course, again, there's less difference to those two things than you might think because when you say that it's irreligious to believe in it, so what should you believe in if you're religious? Like in terms of how to um, get rid of the consequences of these vices, and the answer is you should consult science, and science will tell you how to change your diet and lifestyle and so forth in order to get better. Um, So in the end, the criticism of them is because religion is the religion of reason, the criticism of them as superstitious or irreligious or blasphemous turns out to really be the same as the criticism of them as pseudoscientific. Um, okay, but the reason I've gone into this so much is not because I'm, like I said, I'm, you know, it's not clear that it's such an important issue. I mean, well... There are still issues like this that are with us, for sure. They don't strike me as particularly gendered. I don't know if I'm being naive about that. So um, it doesn't seem like, at least in its original context, it's, what she's saying about it is that important. But I'm, what I'm trying to get out of it is what she thinks about reward and punishment, um, and like divine reward and punishment. And the answer is that she seems to be um, closer, well, um, coinciding really again with Hobbes, right? The violation of a law of nature, the, the punishment for violating a law of nature is going to be a natural consequence of violating that law. And we're going to be able to predict it using our reason. 
I mean, of course, Locke also thinks we can predict it using our reason. It's just, in Locke's case, the proof goes by way of the existence of God and wisdom and goodness of God and so forth. Um, um, but, uh, um, but Wollstonecraft is talking about natural consequences here. Um, and I think, at least, that's what she means by this on the next page, on page 189. Um, closer to the first quote I read, farther up the page. Um, Positive punishment. So I think what she means by that is positive punishment as opposed to natural punishment. Punishment. That would make sense, and it fits with what she says in the beginning of the paragraph, which is the end of the sentence doesn't maybe quite fit with it, so I may be misunderstanding it. But anyway, this is, so this is what it says. Positive punishment appears so contrary to the nature of God discoverable in all his works and in our, in our own sorry positive punishment appears so contrary to the nature of God discoverable in all his works and in our own reason that I could sooner believe that the deity paid no attention to the conduct of men than that he punished without the benevolent design of reforming so it's that last part about the design of reforming that seems a little bit out of place from what I'm thinking she means there but I think, actually, let me go back to it one more time. I think, again, that positive punishment is, right, like positive law is as opposed to law of nature. That positive punishment is opposed to um, natural punishment. It means that God has just arbitrarily set so-and-so as the punishment for doing this, as opposed to creating the world in such a way that doing this has bad consequences for you. Um, so, um, and, um, and uh, I think it's connected to, it appears so contrary to the nature of God discoverable in all his works and in our own reason, meaning that we learn what kind of, um, We learn what kind of justice to expect from God from, from observing the laws of nature not, and or using our own reason to figure out what the consequences of various things would be. Um, so it's completely contrary to that to say, oh, and by the way, uh, I also think God set up these following arbitrary punishments for certain things. Um, now, I mean, um, I'm not going into this because I'm really interested in Wollstonecraft's theology. I, I mean, that would be interesting. She doesn't say enough about it, you know, for me to really uh, figure out what's going on there. But I mean, what she does say enough about is, again, to figure out that... Um, that the way she understands the divine law or the divine will or religion or whatever is supposed to completely coincide with um, rational advice about what is the best thing to do, right? Or like remembering what she said last time about virtue that deserves the name must be based on knowledge. Um, it's really, I mean, it's the same thing that essentially that Socrates um, uh, argues in the Euthyphro, if you pay attention to what Socrates actually thinks in the Euthyphro, which is that um, um, piety is what's pleasing to the gods because it's rational. Um, so, uh, because God's worthy of the name, that's that's the kind of service they would want. Um, right. So, um, and so therefore, you know, I, I don't know how many people have read the Euthyphro, 
but I'm assuming a num some people have read it. It's kind of a popular text to assign. Um, but uh, yeah, anyway, maybe I shouldn't say more about it. Um, um, but it is another way in which I feel like Wollstonecraft's position is Socratic. And there's so many ways that I feel like it's not a coincidence, even though uh, I'm not aware that she ever mentions Socrates. Um, then again, I mean, Locke doesn't mention Socrates in the place where he's clearly thinking about Socrates either. Um, okay, so um, so the result of that whole long digression was basically that um, it appears that between Hobbes and Locke, Right. Again, the question was um, whether the law of nature is literally a law in the state of nature. It seems like uh, Wollstonecraft agrees with Hobbes that it isn't. Um, at least it's not what Hobbes or Locke would call a law because it doesn't have positive punishment attached to it. I mean, another way of translating positive is, as I think I mentioned before, right, like um, positing or thesis is what um, legislation is called in Greek. Um, or nomothesis, like law placing, law putting, law positing. Um, so, right, positive law is legislated law. Um, it means that um, um, there can't be punishment that exists just because God wills it to be punishment. All punishment has to be a natural consequence of vice, rationally discoverable. So, um, so that means that, that, I mean, that is all punishment for the law of nature. She's not talking about civil laws here, of course. I mean, she's not explicitly talking about laws at all, but she's talking about punishment, and therefore she's talking about law, right? But it's, it's the law of nature she's talking about, the divine law. So, and what she's saying is that it, as Locke defines punishment, it doesn't have punishments. Um... um So now the question is, I asked the same question last time, and I ask her to come back to it again. If she, so if she agrees with Hobbes about that, um, if she agrees with Hobbes that uh, the law of nature and the state of nature is not literally a law, but just advice, why doesn't she reach Hobbes's conclusions? Um, right? After all, you know, that was the point where, where, at least as I presented it, that was the point where Locke found a way into Hobbes, you know, to, to uh, cut off Hobbes' argument by saying, no, it's not true that the state of nature is a lawless state. There is a law in the state of nature, an enforceable law in the state of nature. Um, and therefore, people can make covenants in the state of nature, and people can own property in the state of nature, and so on and so forth. So if she's denying all that, why don't we just get back to Hobbes? So um, part of the answer is that um, although she agrees that the law of nature can't be executed by positive punishments. It's not for the same reason that Hobbes would give. Um, so, you know, the reason um, Hobbes thinks that the divine law can't be executed by positive divine punishments is... Um, that 
So for the for the law of nature to uh, to be to be enforced by God as the executive, Hobbes says we would have to um, be be able to uh, ask God what the punishments are for what and find out how, you know how the law, which laws are going to be enforced and how. But according to Hobbes, in the state of nature, there's no way to ask God's God things. Why? Because, um, or at least uh, there's no rational way to ask God for things because, um, to, uh, you know, setting aside the possibility that God speaks to you directly, although even then there's going to be a question how you know that was God speaking to you, right? But setting aside the uh, possibility that God speaks to you directly, in order to find out what God wants, you're going to have to ask a human agent of God. Someone who bears God's person, right? They're going to be able to tell you on God's behalf what the law, what the divine law is and how it will be rewarded or punished. Um, but, um, but Hobbes says, in a state of nature, no one can be authorized to do that any more than anyone else. So there's just no way of receiving a, a reliable answer about this. Maybe instead of rational, I should have said reliable, uh, uh, constant, consistent, coherent answer to this. Right? I mean, in the state of nature, according to Hobbes, you're just going to be faced with a whole bunch of people saying, I heard God wants us to do this, and God told me to do this, and so on and so forth. And because there is no uh, uh, antecedent law that governs all of these people, there's no way of telling which one is authorized to speak and which one isn't. Um, so, I mean... Because that's the problem, according to Hobbes, it also, according to Hobbes, can be solved in a civil state, right? Because in a civil state, the sovereign tells you who's authorized to interpret God. Um, and then that's reliable. It's always going to be the same, at least if the sovereign does what they're supposed to, right? That is, if the sovereign properly polices uh, religious doctrine and teaching, the way Hobbes says they have a duty to, then um, then you're always going to get one answer to that. Um, so, I mean, we know what Wollstonecraft has to say about that setup. Um, this is on page 186. The oracles of old were thus delivered by priests dedicated to the service of the God who was supposed to inspire them. The glare of worldly pomp which surrounded these impostors, and the respect paid to them by artful politicians who knew how to avail themselves of this useful engine to bend the necks of the strong under the dominion of the cunning, spread a sacred mysterious veil of sanctity over their lies and abominations. <laughs> Right, so what uh, Wollstonecraft is saying is that, you know, yeah, for sure, it's true in uh, a civil state, especially of the barbarous or savage kind that Rousseau or Hobbes really is in favor of, um, there definitely can be someone who has the authority to tell you what God wants. Um, and moreover, it can be true in a certain sense that what they tell you is in the best interests of the state, but only insofar as we think of the state as like the possession of the people who are in power, right? It's going to, because it's going to be in their best interest, not in our best interest. Um, so, um, and therefore, I think her ar argument is. We can be sure these people are imposters. 
you don't have to look into the cave and see whether that you know what's going on in there or whatever um they're imposters because they claim to say something on behalf of God that we can't figure out by our own reason. They claim to a substitute some other authority than our own reason and attribute it to God. And that's, that's automatically false. That's how you can tell that you have a false prophet. Um, And so, I mean, from Wilson Craft's point of view, that's why you can't have either in the state of nature or in a civil state um, uh, the law of nature enforced by positive divine punishments. Because um, um, If you obey it for that reason, you wouldn't be obeying it. I'll explain that a little bit more, more in a second, but um, let me first read what she actually says. Um, this is on page 198. the second paragraph of section 6 of chapter 13. It's on page 198. Um, that being cannot be termed rational or virtuous who obeys any authority but that of reason. Right? So it can't be enforced by an authorized or unauthorized oracle. Anyone who comes and tells you, um, you know, says, hey, don't eat food so-and-so, and I say, why? And they say, um, because God told me God is going to punish you if you do. Then um, God appointed me as his agent <laughs> to tell you this. Um, the answer is... Um, um, God can only to tell us to do things through our own reason. Therefore, you're lying. Again, I think that's what the essence of what Socrates is saying to Euthyphro in the Euthyphro. Um, um, but again, I can't assume everyone's read the Euthyphro, so I'll leave it at that. Um, Okay, are there questions before I go on? I've been talking to, oops, I haven't switched back to me. You're seeing Wilson Craft, which is probably more interesting. Or you're seeing me too, but anyway, I'll switch back to the board. All right, here we go. Um, I've been talking for a long time now without questions about weird stuff. I have to tell you, I'm not completely confident that this all fits together. This is the first time I've said this. Maybe next year it'll be better. <laughs> so are there questions, objections? Um, my yeah. question doesn't have to do with what you were talking about. It has to do with Wilson Craft, but it's still with family. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Although I, I greatly appreciate all of the other insight on that she was, uh, you were sharing. Um, <laughs> my question though for Wilson Craft is on like, does she, what is the difference for her as like the family unit in the state of nature versus after? Like, does it change or shift? Um, that's one. And then my I kind of wanted to from my understanding it seems as with Locke and I guess Wilson Craft because as you expressed they have so many things in common in terms of family um would Wilson Craft see family differently because she has an understanding of gender roles or she's expressed like an understanding of gender roles 
those are both hard questions to answer. I mean, in the, and both hard to answer because the authors we're asking about don't say enough in places that I'm familiar with anyway. So like in Wollstonecraft's case, I'm not sure how she imagines a family in the state of nature. I think I said the same thing before when probably you asked the same question or someone asked the same question before um, that, uh, you know, she doesn't spend a lot of time talking about the state of the original state of nature. It's not very important to her because it's not the time, according to her, when humans are living naturally. The real time when humans are living naturally is in the future, in true civilization. So, um, yeah, so she doesn't, she doesn't say a lot about it. I mean, I have to think that, you know, I mean, considering how much she thinks that the family has been affected by the transition from barbarism to partial civilization and how much it would again be affected by a transition to true civilization, I assume that she also thinks that the very beginning of human societies in the state of nature also caused huge changes in the family unit, but I don't know exactly what. Maybe if you think about it, you could, you could try to figure out. Um, and the other question, it's a similar issue, only this time it's with Locke, that Locke does not say enough about how he understands gender roles. Right, Rolstenschreff says a lot about it for obvious reasons, and what she thinks about it is complicated, right? I mean, she thinks there are certain duties that naturally fall to women, um, at least more than they do to men, but she doesn't think that, uh, she thinks, number one, that's extra reason why women should be free and uh, educated, um, at least as much as men, and but number two, she doesn't also doesn't think that that should prevent women from doing. And I don't know if it's anything that men do, but she gives a long list at some point, right? She says women should be able to be physicians. Uh, you know, I forget the whole list, but um, so um, I guess she does say she's not advocating women going into combat and war. But she's not very into war anyway, right? I mean, she doesn't really advocate men going into war except in a defensive war. Um, so anyway, um, you know, so Wilsoncraft says all that about it. The only thing Locke says about it is that both parents have basically the same authority, except there's a kind of tiebreaker when they disagree what's going to be done with the children, the, the man will have the last word. Um, and he, he gives an explanation for that, although it's not a very convincing one. But as I said, he's probably just trying to explain what he sees happening everywhere. He says, well, you know, because the man is stronger. You know, that's, you know, that's obviously not a very... Uh, meaning physically stronger on average. Certainly a lot of women who are physically much stronger than me. <laughs> um, on average, right? I mean, that's not really a, that's a pretty faint reason. But anyway, that's pretty much all he says about it. We don't know if he thinks there's any other diff. I mean, he doesn't talk as Rousseau does and Wilsoncraft does about breastfeeding. We don't know what he thinks about that. And, uh, Unless, again, this book, Locke did write a book on education, which I still haven't read, and maybe he talks about some of that stuff there. But that's all I can tell you. Okay, so those are good questions, but as you said, they did kind of break, break the flow of what I'm talking about here. Let me try to get back into it in the last five minutes. Um, so I think, like, what, so why would she say that being cannot be termed rational or virtuous who obeys any authority but that of reason? Or why she would say it? Um, anyway, I guess I would say this, this throws more light on what I was saying last time. It's, it's, it's kind of the same as or explains or is the effect of what I was saying last time about that for Wollstonecraft, there's no shortcut. Um, that, um, right, according to Hobbes, uh, you know, um, 
we can't have a peaceful society in the state of nature basically because of this very fact that you know um, although the laws of nature would be the best thing to do most people aren't rational we can't count on them to do it um, and uh, um, that is as I was saying last time, we could count on them to do it if they wanted what you should really want, what's really good in life, but we can't expect them to want that. All we can expect them is to be rational enough to figure out how to get the advantage over us in um, command, uh, wealth, and, uh, sens and sensible pleasures. Right? So we can expect them to be rational enough to do that, but that means in the state of nature that we won't be able to have any wealth or command or sensible pleasures because everyone will always be taking everything away from anyone who gets it and it will be solitary, uh, nasty, brutish, and short. Right? So, but Hobbes says, although all of that is true in the state of nature, fortunately there's this other thing we can do um, where we set up an absolute sovereign and they force us to be rational, essentially. They force us to be peaceful. But um, Wollstonecraft thinks, I believe, that that's literally impossible in the sense that um, like a political society has to be a society of persons, that is, of, like, responsible, rational beings. Um, where, you know, uh, well, maybe I shouldn't emphasize this because she doesn't use the term person a lot, but I'm using that term, I guess, the way Locke does, as a, a quote-unquote, a forensic term. Wait, did we even read that in here? Maybe not. That's from the essay. I don't remember if I signed that. I think I did, about personal identity. I don't remember. Well, anyway, so, um, right, so it's supposed to be a, a, an arrangement of rational beings to live together peacefully, right? I mean, if you don't add that qualification, if you just say it's an arrangement for some things to live together peacefully, then it's easily for easy. For example, rocks can live together peacefully. <laughs> right? I mean, they don't do anything to each other. Uh, although my kids have some pet, pet rocks that are always fighting each other, but uh, usually rocks don't do anything to each other. So, I mean, the issue here that we're dealing with is how can rational beings live together peacefully? And the answer can't be that I enter a covenant to substitute someone else's commands for my own reason. Because... If I succeeded in doing that, I wouldn't be a rational being anymore. Right? That, again, is what she means by that quote. You know, that being cannot be termed rational or virtuous who obeys any authority but that of reason. So, like, so, to, so, so I can't. It's impossible. <laughs> that is... Um, to the extent that we succeeded in doing that, we wouldn't be us anymore. Now, I mean, did we perfectly succeed in doing that? No, as Hobbes agrees, and that's why there's some hope for us, according to Wilson Craig. <laughs> but if we did perfectly succeed in doing that, then we wouldn't have a society of rational beings. We would have a society of animals, basically, of like non-human, non-rational animals. Um, okay, now I see I only have one minute left, and that's the last minute of the course. <laughs> so I guess I'll just say one more thing about this. So, like, why, if that's the case, then, so if she agrees with Hobbes that there's no law in a state of nature, and, but she disagrees with him about whether we can set up his kind of commonwealth to get out of the state of nature. Why isn't the conclusion we're stuck in the war of all against all? Right? Like anarchism in a bad sense of anarchism. Um, like admitting that anarchy is terrible but saying that there's no alternative to it. Why isn't that where she ends up? 
And I think the answer is because you have to look farther into the way in which certain vices have bad, have bad consequences. So like drinking too much has the kind of bad consequence that it makes you sick. But tyrannizing over others, trying to put yourself in the place of their reason, has the bad effect of making them worse. That is, of making them morally worse. So this, again, is an old Socratic argument. I don't have time to read it from Wollstonecraft. I'm, I'm, out, I'm one minute over time right now. But uh, Wollstonecraft also basically makes it that um, um, that uh, oppression has of rational beings has the effect of making them cunning and um, therefore it makes things bad for the oppressor. Um, you can never rest easy after that. So, um, so she thinks, and the whole subject of this book basically is that the oppression of women and the way that they in turn oppress their children and the oppressed men too, if they can find a cunning way to do it, is an example of all of this, right? That is the way women have been oppressed has made them worse and therefore has made society worse for everyone. Um, but it also shows the possibly possible way out according to her. And I think, you know, if I could say one thing in like summary of what her position is, she thinks that Hobbes and Rousseau and even maybe Locke have underestimated the possible political rationality of quote unquote man just because they forgot to notice how that term both does and does not include women. Okay, thank you. That's that's the end. Now I know I would stay said I would stay some more time if people have questions. Do people have questions? There's uh, a lot of concern about oppression here. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, uh, first of all, for the lecture and the class. Oh, thank you. Um, and, um, well, I guess my question is tied to, I think, the last thing that you were talking about, where it's like underestimated the political rationality of man. Oh, what was that? <laughs> that was Petunia. Yeah. <laughs> Wow, she's so uh, royal. <laughs> um, so with the, with your mentioning of her saying, um, you know, she feels that these other philosophers have underestimated the political rationality of man. Do you feel like um, her take on the family unit versus um, per se like Locke or Rousseau's um, like lacks um, a sense of understanding of like the patriarchy like they're just able not they're just not able to speak on it because they just don't know they've never gone through the experience of being a woman yeah it's a good question I mean she does think that they're overlooking something um that, you know, I guess, you know, like to put another way, the thing I said at the end just there was that, you know, they think human beings can't be reformed in a certain way because they're attributing to human nature something that's really the effect of oppression of women, right? That has, that means that education isn't done right and that, you know, everything is wrong because of that. Um, but does she think it's because they don't have the experience of being a woman? And, you know, she probably does have to think she thinks that. I mean, that it's not a coincidence. She doesn't think it's a coincidence that she's a woman and she's writing this book. But she doesn't mostly um, or ever argue from that point of view. Um Right? She doesn't say, and take my word for it, because I'm a woman and I've experienced it. And you can kind of see why she wouldn't, too, when you think about the, her position as I was just outlining it. 
that, you know, in these matters, she can't tell us to take her word for it. So, um, um, right, she can't say there's something I know that you can never know, and because of that, um, you should change your view or your practice. That would just be like being one of those bad old-time oracles, right? Saying, like, substitute my authority for your reason. So instead, she has to say, um, um, you know, for whatever reason you've overlooked it, it can be remedied. You can learn, you know. You don't have to, so, right, without having to make Locke and Rousseau and Hobbes be women, <laughs> they can learn, she thinks, uh, or hopes. And, I mean, of course, they're all dead at the point she's writing this book, but meaning, you know, the views they represent, people who hold the views they represent can learn these things. I don't know, does that address your question? Yeah, that makes sense. And I definitely can see how she, why she wouldn't say that because women are already viewed as emotional beings and kind of irrational. Mm. But no, um, but that's not, I'm saying that's not why she wouldn't say that. Oh, okay. I'm saying she wouldn't say that because she, she, she doesn't think that in, telling someone else what to do, you can ever appeal to things that they don't know themselves. You must appeal to, when you're trying to get a rational being to do something, you must appeal to what they know. So if it's something that only you know because of your experience, it's not usable. Right, so it's not like I'm saying, I think on her part, this is not like a rhetorical strategy. Like if I started talking about my bad experiences, I would be dismissed as emotional or something. It's like, I think it's fundamental to her view that, you know, to the, the view she's trying to get across about politics and so forth that, um, um, you know, just like a man couldn't, shouldn't, according to her, say to a woman, look, you don't understand this because you're a woman, but I'm telling you, do X, Y, and Z. She can't, say this, she can't say the same thing in reverse. Okay. I, I think that's what she thinks. I'm not saying that's necessarily right. I know there's definitely arguments of, like, a lot of other arguments to be made about epistemology and rationality and all, you know, I mean, this is not easy, but I'm saying I think that's what she thinks. So I think okay. she wouldn't make that argument. Um, you said your spots for tomorrow are filling quickly. What? To meet. Um, oh. Oh, oh! you wanted to meet tomorrow? Yes. Uh, and this is tomorrow? I can't always tell who's talking. because you. Yes, it's okay. tomorrow. All right, that's what I thought, but I wasn't sure. Um, uh... Tomorrow. I, I can. I'll email you right now. Just okay. So you have it. Tomorrow is not great. Would it be okay? I know it's getting close to when the paper is due, but uh, would it be okay to meet on Sunday instead, maybe? Okay. Yeah. That would be a lot easier for me. The paper is due on on the seventeenth, correct? I believe. So. Uh, I don't know. If you say so, I, I would have to check the syllabus to know. <laughs> it's due on the seventeenth. Okay, seventeenth. Okay. Okay, Professor. Um, I'll, I'll email you. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Anyone else have questions before I go? I just want to say thank you. Okay, well, thank thank you to to all of you once again, um, and uh, have a good break. <laughs>